So this is a little bit different setup this morning and I'll just break down why we're doing it this way. Um, Brittany and I, we try to read through the Bible together every year and um, whenever I say together, it's not like we sit down and one of us reads and then the other one reads or something like that, you know, we, but we, we read the same thing each day. Um, that's part of how we study a little bit, but then we try to come together and discuss what we've read, especially if it's, if it's something that God's like really stirring in our hearts. And this passage that, uh, that we're going to be covering today did really stir in our hearts. It, it kind of, God was ministering and revealing stuff to both of us at the same time. And as we started to discuss it, I don't know if you guys know this, but I get kind of passionate about things, um, especially the Word of God. And then she's getting passionate too, and she's like revealing all this other stuff, and it's it's great stuff, and it's stuff that I didn't catch, you know. Or or maybe it was taken, um, the Holy Spirit was revealing it to her in a way that that He didn't necessarily reveal it to me, and it was just so cool. And I'm like, man, isn't it just like our God to uh, to help complete and bring bring more knowledge and revelation and understanding together through other people. You know, the word says as iron sharpens iron, so does one person sharpen another. And um, that's exactly what uh, he does with my wife and, and I, and I just, I just love it. I just get blown away by it. And the stuff that he was telling her, I'm like, I wanted to, I wanted to teach on it, but then I was like, man, I'm not going to be able to reveal to you guys and relay to you guys the way that, that she does because she's the one that received it. And um, she's beautiful, and, and she's much easier to look at than I am, so I thought, you know, it'd be a win-win for everybody. But um, So this morning, if you guys want to turn with us, we're going to be in uh, 1 Kings chapter 13. I kind of titled this Hearing and Doing. Because of the uh, the story that's laid out here, and I just want to remind you guys that just because this story happened, these things happened a long, long time ago. They still happened. It's not just a story that somebody wrote down. It really did legitimately happen, and this stuff is actually documented throughout actual um, historical documents. Not just the Bible. It's not just a a Christian thing, but it's actual history. And I get a lot of a lot of joy in searching kind of the historical stuff. And as I'm reading through these things and being able to piece together other things that come out of it is just really neat to me, you know, and to to try to wrap my mind around um, okay, so this person is, is who? And then whenever you can actually put all these puzzle pieces together, so much more cool. Um, but uh, I will, I'm going to read through chapter 13, literally the whole chapter, so bear with me. Um, and then I'll go through and kind of hit some of the highlights of it to put it, bring it into perspective. And then we'll get into kind of discussing um, what, what the Lord was showing us through it. So before I do that, let's just uh, pray this morning. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will reveal to us everything that you want us to receive out of today. I pray that um, that we will be vessels used by you, that you will speak through us. And Lord, open our eyes and our ears, uh, our hearts and our minds to understand what it is that you have for us today. And I just pray that your name will be honored and glorified in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start in chapter 13, verse 1. I'm reading out of the ESV. It's um, maybe not my, my favorite version, but it's the version that I've got today. So it says, And behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam, who was the king at the time, was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born of the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places 
who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down or broken apart, and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the sayings of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. The altar also was torn down or broke open, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, Entreat the favor of your Lord God, or ask God to take this back, and pray for me that I may be restored or my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, If you gave me half your house or half of your kingdom, I will not go with you, and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place, for so was it commanded me by the word of the Lord, or so God told me not to, saying, You shall neither eat bread or drink water, nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. Now an old prophet lived in Bethel. So at the same time, an older prophet lived in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words that he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? And his sons showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he mounted it. And after he went after the man of God, he found him sitting under an oak. He said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, You shall neither eat bread nor drink water from there, nor return by the way you came. And he said to him, I also am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah. Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in this place, of which he said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. And after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown in the road, and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road and the lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet, who had brought him back from the way, heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion. 
which has torn him and killed him according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. And they saddled it. And he went and found the body thrown in the road, and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body, nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And after he had buried him, he said to his sons, When I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. It goes on and it says, After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high places again from among all the people. Any who would be ordained to be priest or of the high places, and this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. There is so much in this chapter. But I want to highlight a couple things before we, before we get into this portion of it, uh, the discussion about hearing and doing. So we've got somebody that's called a man of God. See, I can't even sit down. We've got somebody here called a man of God. And then the prophet, the old prophet, it says, we've got this old prophet. And they're in this town uh, called Bethel, which means place of God or, or um, uh, place of worship. Well, Bethel actually started out, and they're at this altar. Altar is where they make sacrifices to these gods, right? Right? This isn't an altar to the God, but the place of Bethel, the place of God, this place of worship, was very first, um, it came about because the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, which one? I don't know. <laughs> she said, I don't know. It was Jacob. Jacob was running from his brother, and because God had saved him from his brother at that point, and he met with him there. That's, that's the same place. Remember where he wrestles with God? That's the place that this is. Well, the man of God, not the old prophet, but the man of God came from um, Judah. Well, Samuel, a few years back, about, it was a little over um, probably 80 years at this point. Samuel anoints Saul to be king. Saul's the first king of Israel. And then, we all know the story, David rises up, David becomes king, David reigns for 40 years, Saul reigned for 40 years, then David reigns for 40 years, and then his son Solomon takes over. During David's reign, it was always war. I mean, just like constant war, that was his, his part. But during the kingship of Solomon, his son, it says... The, the nation had rest from war because he was the wisest person ever to live. And he had uh, good standing with God. But then, as time goes on, he starts to sin and he starts to bring in all of these, uh, these wives from other nations. And then they uh, encourage him to start worshiping other gods. And so it says that Solomon started building these altars all over Israel to worship these gods with his wives. That's when things started going downhill pretty bad. But he had peace throughout this whole time. If you remember, Solomon had a wife from Egypt and had a great relationship with, with the Pharaoh from Egypt. But then, after Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam starts to be king. But... At the end of Solomon's life, he tries to kill a guy named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam flees to Israel. He runs from King Solomon because if King Solomon wants you dead, you're going to be dead. That's just the way it is. 
But he flees. He's staying in Israel or in Egypt at this time. And there's the uh, Pharaoh there named Shishak. It's kind of a weird name, right? Shishak. But Shishak loved um, Rehoboam or Jeroboam. I'm sorry. He loved Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, whenever Solomon dies, he's like, I want to go back to Israel. And, and Pharaoh's like, no, you don't need to go back to Israel. You've got everything here. He's like, well, I want to go back to Israel. And he's going back to Israel because he wants to be king. Well, Rehoboam, Samuel's uh, son, Solomon's son, doesn't want him to be king. And he doesn't do a real good job at being a king himself. Like he starts taking the advice from his, his, his friends that grew up with him instead of his dad's trusted advisors rejects what they said, and because he rejected what they said, it split Israel. It not only split Israel, but he only had two groups of people following. That was Judah, the tribe of Judah, and Benjamin, and Benjamin was a very small tribe. So he's got like one and a half tribes, and the rest of them are following Jeroboam. But Jeroboam is the one listed in this, in this story that we just read. He's the one at the altar getting ready to make sacrifices to a king that's not God, to a God that's not God, the Most High God, creating all this havoc in Israel. And that, that kind of leads us up to this. The, the nation is split right now. There's two different kings. And the word says that Jeroboam and Rehoboam were constantly fighting each other. They were constantly fighting. But where did the man of God come from? He came from Judah which is a tribe that's under Rehoboam. And he had to go all the way to Bethel to give this word. God had to send somebody from all the way over in Judah to Bethel to give this word. And if you know anything about this, God actually appointed Jeroboam to be king too. Told him he was going to be king. But then took it from him because he didn't serve him. But isn't it interesting that there was an old prophet that came to find this man of God. An old prophet? And I started thinking, at this point, God already declared that a man's life would be about 120 years. The reason that I brought up how long these guys were kings and where he was living in Bethel there's a very good chance that he served under King David and possibly under King Saul. He's an old prophet who hears from God, yet God didn't use him. He brought somebody from Judah all the way down to have, have this conversation with him. I thought that was pretty interesting, and we'll get into a little bit more of that as we go along. This is a tad bit of a bunny trail, but I feel like it needs to be said. When he was talking about Solomon um, and how he ended up serving other gods and was swayed by his wife, wives, I, what I think is so interesting about that to me is that the Bible says that Solomon was the wisest man to ever live because he had asked God for wisdom, you know? And yet, being the wisest man to have ever lived he fell into temptation and turned from God. And, and that's not to be like a Debbie Downer, but it was like a reminder to me that sin and temptation is no respecter of persons, of status, of giftings, of character, you know? I mean, you're talking about this man that is, has great character and has done great things and has been given wisdom by God, but yet he was tempted and fell into that temptation. And so I just think it's something that's good to remember because a lot of times as we get stronger in our relationship with the Lord, um, things do become less um, of a struggle a lot of times. You know, like the closer we get to Him, you know, there's things that it's not, you don't even think twice about doing, but He tells us to keep our armor on and to put it on every day and because the enemy's going to come in. I mean, obviously he tempted Jesus, and that's a good example of that. But 
Jesus, of course, prevailed and did not give in to temptation. Yeah. Another interesting thing is the man of God told um, told the king, Jeroboam, he said that one of the words that he spoke was that God was going to raise up somebody out of the line of David and would would literally destroy that altar, gave the actual name of the individual who it was going to happen with, and and Jeroboam was not from the line of David. He was the son of a um, somebody that wasn't even in his line whatsoever. So kingdoms were always fought over, battled over, and you were always worried that the, the previous king's family was going to come back and, and take over the kingdom. <clears throat> and so this prophecy, whenever it, this man of God lays this out, he gave the actual name of the guy, and it happened exactly like he says 340 years later. Jeroboam, he didn't get to see that take place, but he had to live with the fact that this, this probably was going to take place, and he knew that it was actually going to take place because when he stretches out his hand and says, seize him, his hand shrivels up, he can't even bring it back to himself. God was saying, I'm the real God. I'm the actual God. And then he, he busts open the altar, and the ashes from all the sacrifices pours out, that's just proof. It's proof upon proof that everything that he says is going to actually happen. So he had to live like looking over his shoulder the whole rest of his life, which wasn't too much longer, but had to look over his shoulder the whole time, knowing the kingdom is not going to stay yours. It's not going to. And I thought that was really cool. So Brittany and I, we started to... We started to look at this, and really what stood out to us, what kind of jumped out at first was, man, this says that one of them is a man of God, and obviously he's being influenced by God. He's being told to go, and, and it's the truth. But then this other guy says that he's a prophet, and the Word says that he's a prophet, and that he hears from God too, and he lies to this guy ultimately getting him killed. We're like, what's up? This is not fair. <laughs> like, what's going on? And so that, that's kind of what drew us into this and, and started to spark our interest in it and, and make us really start digging deeper into it because we thought, you know what? There's a lot of implications here. There's a lot that we need to take into consideration because this is showing that a man of God that hears from God that, that has a clear word from God and his, it, his word, he's being obedient. And then he's, he doesn't even go back with the king. The king wants to reward him and give him stuff. And he's like, no, man, I, I'm going to be true to my God. And he didn't turn from what God told him to do and tell another man of God said, I also heard from God. I also heard from an angel from God that told me to tell you this. And then he did. And he disobeyed God because he listened to what somebody else that also hears from God told him to do whenever God himself didn't tell him to do it. He veered from God's path by listening to what he thought was wise counsel, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, that was... I mean, first of all, like when I read this, I'm like, well, that's not fair. Why did the guy who lied not get punished <laughs> and the one who disobeyed died, you know? But, um, but what, like Nathan was talking about, you know, with the wise counsel thing, that's something growing up I've heard so many times, um, you know, seek wise counsel. It's important to seek wise counsel. And that is 100% true. The Bible tells us to do that. Um, and I wanted to read a couple of verses about that. Um, my journal was a mess, and so I thought this would be more organized. But <laughs> no. Okay, it says... Uh, 
Proverbs 19, 20, and 21. Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. Many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. And um, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. That's Proverbs 15, 22. And there are tons of scriptures that talk about the importance of seeking wise counsel, you know. And so the Lord's clear about that. That's important. That's important, you know, for the body of Christ, like Nathan was saying, to bounce things off of each other. However, no man's counsel ever stands above the Lord's counsel. And so, you know, that's kind of what we were seeing here. It was just like, okay, this guy heard from the Lord. The Lord spoke to him directly, and God still does that today with us. You know, he speaks directly to us, whether it's in time of worship, in time of prayer, through his word. He's always speaking through his word. Like Nathan said before, it's live and active. And, um, but, you know, he's spoke to this man, and the man knew 100% it was God. Like, because he proved it, like Nathan said, and the scriptures say, like, when he spoke it, you know, the man's hand shriveled, Jeroboam's hand shriveled, he saw the altar break in half and the ashes, you know, so if he was doubting on his way there, you know, if he was stepping out in faith, like, okay, God, you gave me this word, you know, I mean, that's a big step of faith to go to a king and to basically say, you're wrong, <laughs> You know, and so if he was doubting at any point on his way there, God showed himself faithful. God showed himself, this is me, I have spoken to you. So he should have no doubts of what God told him, you know? And then the king asked him, pray to your God to fix my hand. Mm -hmm. And and the man of God had, had mercy on him because the king was about to have him killed. I mean, that's what was going to happen. He said, right. seize him. He's going to be killed. His hand shrivels up, and then Jeroboam says, pray to your God. Not the God that we're making sacrifices to here. Pray to your God to fix this hand. Mm-hmm. And he did. And then God had mercy on Jeroboam. And it's almost like that, that second chance. Hey, listen, you've been messing up. It's clear that I'm the one. Right. And he still didn't. But the man of God repent. got to see, right? God's got to see God's faithfulness. Yeah. yeah. So there should have been no question, and there was no question. Even when the prophet, the old prophet, you know, said, "Come back and eat with me," his first response was, "No, God told me not to." Mm-hmm. But somehow he was swayed when the prophet said, "Well, I'm a prophet too, and I have a word." You know, we did think it was interesting that he said, "I have a word from an angel." from the word of the Lord, you know, and we, we like to read commentaries and kind of see what, you know, other people's perspective, and one was saying maybe he had heard from an angel, but it was not a godly spiritual being. However, I don't necessarily think that happened because the Bible flat out says he lied. <laughs> so he didn't hear from nobody, <laughs> you know, and, you know, it's like, what were his motives, what was the old prophet's motives to want him to come back? You know, and it may have just simply been selfishness. Like, you heard from the Lord, you did something amazing, come hang out with me, come eat with me, you know. And, but the biggest thing was that in that moment, he decided to listen to the old prophet and to take his word over the word that the Lord spoke to him. And, and so I think that is something that, we have to be really careful with as believers. And, you know, thinking about this message, it was a little bit hard for me because you see many times, and I feel like this is happening in the church more and more often, people take things out of context into the extreme. And, you know, and so I thought, Lord, I do not want to get up there and open my mouth and someone here don't seek wise counsel. Don't seek men of God, you know? And that's not what we're saying, so please hear me in that. Like, this is not a rebel against anyone that has wisdom and is an elder. It's simply you hear the Lord and you obey the Lord above all else. It doesn't matter someone's 
background. It doesn't matter someone's status. It doesn't matter someone's authority, you know, and that's something else you've seen happen in the churches. You know, pastors, you know, at times there's been pastors that start to go off path. You know, they, they start to follow something that's not in the Word of God. By the way, we're not talking about Pastor Rod. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'm not talking about any pastor in particular. I'm just, I've seen this happen in the church many times, though. And many people follow. And they follow because they see the status, they see the position, and probably trust, too, you know? Um, and so it's just being so careful to be obedient to what the Lord has spoken to you, you know, and, and never taking someone else's word over his word. You know, and when he speaks to you, you know, because that's the other side, you know, you have to know how to decipher the voice of the Lord. He's always speaking, and, and his word says, we are his sheep, and his sheep know the shepherd's voice. But how we know the voice is by knowing him and having relationship with him and being in his word. This is his voice. <laughs> and so... Um, you know, there's just a lot of things that we have to watch our step. And it's not a, you've got to do this and you've got to do this. It's a loving father that knows that the enemy is out to kill, steal, and destroy, and that he's going to try to do anything he can to distract us, to destroy us, to bring confusion in our lives, to get us off track for his best. And so he's saying, watch your step. You know, it says his word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And so we always take any word he speaks to us to his word and make sure that it does not contradict his written word because he's not going to tell you something and contradict himself. But that is the ultimate, that is the ultimate word. So if God has told you something, and then someone who's even wise and godly and loving comes and tells you something that contradicts what you know 100% God has told you, then you need to be real careful not to be swayed by that. And there's one more thing I want to say, and then I'll let Nathan talk again, but I don't want to take over here. But um, that scripture that I read, Proverbs 19, let me go back to it. Proverbs 19:20 20 through 21 where it says listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days many plans are in a man's heart but the counsel of the Lord will stand many plans are in a man's heart but the counsel of the Lord will stand that's why his word trumps any man's word because we as humans have our own motives and intentions even if they're good intentions like what the lord reminded me of was when nathan and i several years ago felt like we were supposed to move to indiana we had we owned our own business and some things had happened and we were seeking the lord like okay lord what's the next step we had seen god provide in our business over and over i'm talking miraculous provision, you know, stuff that people say say doesn't happen. And so we were at a place where it was like, oh, things were not good business-wise. And so we're seeking him. We're like, okay, Lord, you've provided time and time again, like, but we want to hear from you. We want to do what, you know, you're telling us to do. Do we, you know, keep, keep open? Do we close our business? What do we do? And, um, we had started a nonprofit as well, ministering, because we saw a need when we opened this business. It was a security business, if you guys don't know. My husband was a Marine, and he was a police officer, and we just had a heart for um, people in that line of work, because they face a lot of trauma. And, um, and so we, we started hiring veterans and military and law enforcement and started really seeing a need for ministry. So on the side, we started a nonprofit and started working a lot in that. And so we were just thinking, well, maybe the Lord's ready to just move us fully into our nonprofit, you know, that we need to be fully present in that. And so we were seeking him. And long story short, I won't go on the whole story today, but he opened up a door for us to move out of state and go to Indiana and to work with a big worship group 
and for Nathan to be kind of doing security for them and their team and their facility. And um, we, you know, we started seeking him, and that's what he showed us. And I did not want to go. <laughs> My, you know, our family had been in the Kansas City area since Nathan and I met. Our girls were established, and they had gone to the same private school all their lives from the time they were in preschool, you know, and they were in high school, middle school, and elementary, so they were stair-stepped. And I just thought, I do not want to uproot my children. I moved all over all my life when I was a kid, and I never got to establish friendships. And I'm like, this is not my plan, you know. But the Lord was super specific. He gave me a distinct word that this is what I want you to do. And he confirmed it. He spoke to me through his word. He led me to a scripture. He showed me myself crying out to him about seeing something and saying, Lord, something needs to change, you know, and he reminded me of that. He's like, this is the change and just confirmed it in so many ways. My husband obviously got confirmation as well. And, um, and so we knew we heard the Lord, but I'm like, we need to seek wise counsel because that's what his word tells us to do. So we did. And one of the persons that I sought out was my dad. He is He's a godly man. He loves the Lord. He's served the Lord all his life, and, and I trust him to be wise, you know. And he, you know, he, he's wise, so he's very careful not to, to tell me do this or do that because he knows better, you know. <laughs> and um, he knows better in the sense that you've got to be careful about telling people they specifically should do something unless you know 100% the Lord spoke that to you. I've seen many lives derailed because people have spoken in it from a place of wisdom and their word has not been correct. So anyhow, he, um, he told me, he said, look, he's like, you and Nathan love the Lord. You seek the Lord and you obey the Lord. And he's like, he's going to bless you no matter where you go. You know, because he obviously wasn't, the Lord obviously wasn't telling us not to do something. And he's like, he's going to bless you wherever you go. He goes, but you just want to pray and make sure that you don't create unnecessary hardships. He's like, because sometimes we have the freedom to choose things, but when we choose certain things, it creates hardships that otherwise we wouldn't have encountered. So, and this is not sin. I'm not talking about sin or anything like that. So, and it, it was a good word, you know, and I started praying about it. I started thinking about it, and I thought, oh, this is going to create hardship. I mean, you're talking about uprooting children and planting them somewhere completely different, knowing no one. There was going to be challenges and hardships, you know, and, you know, the brain is like, but if we stayed here, we don't have to uproot our whole family. We don't have to, you know, step out and be uncomfortable. So that was the wisdom of a man. But God said, what did I say? What did I say? And so that's just an example of how even the best of hearts and intentions, and my dad wasn't wrong, but that's what I loved about Proverbs, you know, 21, where it says, many are a plans in a man's heart. Okay, so even those that we seek for wise counsel, they have plans in their heart. They have motives. They have things that, intentions, you know, not necessarily evil and bad, but they're going to speak what they're, what they feel is wisdom out of those, out of their heart. But the Lord's plan, his words is what stand. And so we always have to make sure we're obedient to his word. And, um, and so, yeah, with our story, we did, and we did encounter hardships. You know, there, it was hard for our girls. It was hard for us. But during that time, we knew that God was in it because he spoke specifically, and we obeyed his word above all else. Yeah. There are times where people have the best intentions. They're going to advise you like... Uh, like my father-in-law, he was absolutely right. He wanted to warn us of potential hard, hard times. 
Um, and there were hard times. But when God calls you to do things, there's going to be hard times. And if it's not, then maybe he didn't call you. You know, Or maybe you need to find out, am I really doing what I'm supposed to be doing here? Because it doesn't seem hard. <laughs> you know, If you can do it on your own, then you wouldn't need God. Right? So typically the things that he calls you to do, you're going to have to rely on him to be able to get it done. With this situation, it's interesting to me because the old prophet, it says that his sons came to him and told him what happened there and what the man said. So where was the old prophet's sons in order to see this? They were at the altar where this worship to other gods was going on. That's where they were. And they went back to tell their dad. So then he, he's, he's processing all this stuff, and he's like, well, where did he go? Which way did he go? And he, he tells the sons, I don't know why this keeps, it keeps standing out of my head. He tells the sons twice to... Um, to saddle his donkey for him whenever he goes to find the man of God and then after the man of God leaves and they hear about it he tells the sons again saddle my donkey but after the man of God came back home with him and ate and God revealed to this old prophet God actually spoke to the prophet the old prophet spoke to him and told him exactly what was going to happen. So he's, he hears God too. It's not like he doesn't hear God. He hears God. He's been serving God for a long time probably. I don't know where he was at in that relationship with God at this point. You know what all was going on in his home. But I know that he did hear God. But after he gets this revelation from God. That God says good job. This guy's going to die now. And you get to deliver the word to him. He saddled the donkey for him. He didn't have his kids saddled with the donkey. He saddled him for him. I thought, hmm, that's interesting, you know? He's like, you know what? Um, here, let me get that for you. Sorry for bringing you here to the house to, you know. But his intentions, you know, Brittany and I were talking about, what was this old prophet's intentions? Why did he call him to the house? And I thought, well, maybe it was because he wanted to know for sure, is this really a man of God or is he somebody else? You know, it, I, don't, I don't think that he was purposely telling him not to do it. I think that he didn't think anything bad was going to happen. I think he had good intentions. They were selfish intentions probably because he wanted the guy to come to the house. You know, he wanted to be able to talk to him and hear from him. I don't think that he had bad intentions, honestly. And, and a lot of what drives that thought process in me is because when he dies, what happens then? How does he react then? He's like, no, 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 no. You know, and he personally goes and finds the guy and brings him back, puts him in his own tomb. I don't think he had bad intentions. Yeah, and one thing he had said that um, really just... I thought was good the other day he was just talking about how he believes that the old prophet basically didn't believe that the that God was speaking through the guy you know he was doubting the guys who you know that God used him you know that's our opinion like we think that maybe the old prophet like Nathan was saying he he probably thought in his head oh nothing's going to happen if you come and eat with me, you know? And how many times can that derail us as well when God has given us a spe specific word or tells us something to do and others don't believe we have what it takes, you know? Then we start doubting ourselves and we start doubting what God said. Yeah. And... The land had been in kind of upheaval for a while, right? And, and the kingdom had been split. This guy was an old prophet from back before. And now he lives in an area that's ruled by an ungodly person. And in fact, 
so ungodly that if you go through and you start reading uh, kings after Jeroboam, it says every king afterwards, almost everyone afterwards, they were wicked, not as wicked as King Jeroboam. Or they followed in his foot in this wicked King Jeroboam's footsteps. Jeroboam was a wicked dude, like very wicked. Um, and so anyway, that's where this old prophet is living. That's what he's surrounded with right now, you know. And, and he, even though he was a prophet from before, he still clearly wasn't standing up and being bold enough to confront the king. Because God had to send another man of God from somewhere else to come confront the king in the land where the old prophet lived, but that still doesn't mean that God wasn't talking to him. And even though this old prophet was a man of God, he was a prophet too, had relationship with God, he allowed himself to be compromised. And he allowed himself to compromise. And he lied to this man, which ultimately got him killed. So I bring that up because it's extremely important for us as Christians to remain honorable. To keep our moral compass intact. To not step out of that just for our own um, personal desires and wanting to know something, you know, or whatever, to get your own agenda across. Because it can hurt people. It can hurt people. It was just a little lie, right? He knew he was a prophet. He knew that he had heard from God before. He himself. And so he's like, I'm just going to tell a little lie to get what I want. And he did, but it got somebody killed. And so I want you to, I want you to think, after this man of God died, this prophet was very upset. He was, very, he was mourning. He was literally mourning what had happened. He probably felt remorse and all this stuff, but the damage had been done. The man was dead. And, and we can, during our conversation, we were like putting ourselves into, into both of these sides. The person, the man of God that was killed, that was affected by another man of God's lies, another man of God's actions. And then we'd put ourselves in that, that other prophet's shoes, you know, because we've all hurt people, all of us in here. We all love God. But yet we've done things that step outside of that, right? I have. Maybe, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But then we've also been hurt by people. It's very important that, that if we're the ones being hurt by people, we forgive. Rod's message last week was one of the best ever. Absolutely loved it. It was about forgiveness and the necessity of forgiveness. But then also... Seeing this, it's very important that we watch what we say, when we say it, how we say it, and to who we say it to. You know, because it does affect people. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No. So, then we're going along, and just kind of the way that this stuff starts breaking down, and, and this old prophet takes the man of God to his house And, and asks him to do exactly opposite of what God had told him to do. Has anybody ever encouraged you or asked you to do something exactly opposite of what you know you're supposed to do, of what God's told you to do? And maybe you weren't, maybe it's not that you heard specifically to do this exact one thing. But like Brittany said, this is the word of God. This is God's word. It's and you can take it literal. It's the word of God. If, if you're sitting out there and you're like, I've never heard God speak. Then pick this up and read it out loud and you'll hear God speak. Because he's the one that authored this book. You'll hear him speak. Ask him to reveal it to you. Ask him to reveal his purposes and plans to you and he will. So we're dealing with two different men of God. And... Unfortunately, as it plays out, one submits to somebody else because he was deceived. 
And, and as they're eating, they're eating this meal. And the word of the Lord came to the old prophet. He receives the word of the Lord, and it says he cries out. You know, we always hear, and they cried out, they cried out. That crying out means they can't contain it. I bet that he didn't want to give the word that God just told him to the guy that he just convinced to come to his house. I would venture to say he didn't want to let that slip out. You know what? Um, I got to tell you something. I just lied to you, and now you're going to die for it. Like... Yeah, he's going to die because of the disobedience. Yeah. And so he cries out what the, the word of the Lord says to him. He says, you're not going to be able to be buried there. And what's interesting is, is they finish eating. He's like, well, guess I might as well finish eating. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I was hungry. It's been a long journey. <laughs> I don't know. That's just what my mind does. And then, then he's on this donkey traveling down the road, and a lion comes out and attacks him. And it reminded me, as soon as I heard lion, it reminded me the lion of Judah. God is, is often referred to as a lion. Satan, the only time he's referred to as a lion is whenever it says he roams around like a lion. God is referred to as a lion. Satan's always trying to be like God. He's not God, and he's not like God. He tries to be like him. But anyhow, that's just what I heard. That's kind of a side note. And this lion comes out and attacks this guy and mauls him and kills him. Drags his body into the road like he's, he's drug into the road. But the lion doesn't consume him. He doesn't eat him. He just kills him. If, if you've ever watched Animal Planet or anything like that and you see a lion come out and attack something, especially if it's in like a herd of other animals. All the other animals, do they sit around and watch? They go, wow, this is crazy. No, they all leave. If a predator comes out, a donkey's not going to stay there because a donkey's going to be scared to death. But it says the donkey stayed. He didn't get touched. The lion didn't touch the donkey. And the lion stayed next to the body as well. Didn't consume the body, didn't hurt the donkey, stayed there. God did that as another sign to prove that he was the one in the mix controlling all of this. And it's like, well, why would God kill this guy? Because he was tricked. Why would he kill him? He killed him so that all of us can learn this lesson. When God tells you to do something, and He tells you how to do it, when to do it, where to do it, then that's what you're supposed to do. And being disobedient causes a lot of bad things. And in this case, it caused death. Yeah, and I think the other important thing is God is who He says He is, and He keeps His word. Mm -hmm. So... This man of God had already told Jeroboam, I can't eat and drink with you. God specifically told me not to. So for the Lord to let that slide, it's going to make Jeroboam mm -hmm. and all those worshiping other gods see him as not true, yeah. as not a true God, as not a man of his word. He has to be a man of his word. God has to be a man of his word. And... So he has to fulfill what he speaks, especially when, when his children and his followers are speaking it to the lost and unbelievers, you know, because we're representing him. And so he's a loving God. He's not a cruel God. And, and thankfully, um, you know, Jesus has come. And so I'm, I don't fear that I'm going to die when I disobey God now. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. No. Um, but we do have to keep things in perspective. God's still God. And nobody knows the kindness, the mercy, the awesomeness, the personal relationship that we can have with God like the disciples, right? Because they got to live with Jesus. 
And then, after Jesus died and rose again and went to be with his Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with them. So they got to be with Jesus in flesh, hear him walk with him, talk with him, like live life with him, and then they got the Holy Spirit after that. How cool is that? Lucky. Lucky? What? But we think, well, well, God doesn't, he doesn't punish people like that anymore. But I, I want to be, I want all of us to be very, very cautious about doing things outside of the will of God because we feel like he doesn't punish people like that anymore. Because what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? This was after all of that. This was after the Holy Spirit was there. And they lied to the Holy Spirit, and God struck them dead immediately. So there are still consequences for our actions, especially if those actions are done intentionally. Right. Now, this, I don't know. The reason that this man got mauled to death is because he disobeyed the Word of God. So there are definitely consequences to our actions. Right. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So when we're walking in deliberate sin, it leads to death. Maybe not physical death in that moment, but the wages of sin is death. Um, so I think, I don't know how much more you have. Do you have a lot more? We're going to wrap up in about 30, 45 minutes, I'd say. <laughs> 50, 50 minutes? Everybody got 50 minutes? <laughs> Um, well, there was just a few things that I, I wanted to encourage you guys with, um, and just a couple of verses I wanted to read. Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires, which is so good. It sounds, it's like, oh, it cuts off, it cuts through. But his word is so good because it removes what doesn't need to be there. It removes what weighs us down. It removes what discourages us and condemns us and draws us away from him. And so when we're talking about hearing God and being obedient to God, I guess the thing that I think is so important for us is to be in his word. Like, know him. He wants to know us. He wants to have a relationship with us. It's, it's not a religious thing. It's a relationship. And um, Colossians 2.8 says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. I love that verse. That's a verse that I pray over my children all the time because there is so much philosophies out there, you know? There is so many reasonings and human thinking and knowledge. I mean, we live in a generation that knowledge is at our fingertips, you know? And God's warning and reminding us not to be led astray by that stuff. You know, it should not come above Christ. And so I just want to encourage you guys, because those philosophies and stuff, it's not just in the world. You know, so many times it's easy for us as Christians, if we have a relationship with God, to steer clear of the world. You know, this man of God in, in, in First Kings, he had no problems telling Jeroboam, I'm not going to eat with you. It's like we're on our guard when it comes to what is obviously evil. But even, even within the church and stuff, you have, we have to be careful not to start using human reasoning and being led astray from what his word says. You know, And so my encouragement to each of you is to always take everything you hear, even if it's from Nathan or from me or Pastor Rod or you listen to a podcast or you have a friend that's a pastor or a friend that has been a Christian for 40 years, you know, always take what people are 
communicating to you and teaching you and go to his word and ask God, Lord, show me what you have to say about this because he will. He will reveal. His word is active. He will reveal the errors, you know, and um, I was listening to, we were listening to a message by Bill Johnson and he made a comment. I thought it so, so good. He said that sometimes people tell him there's, there's things in the Bible that are wrong. You know, there's, there's errors in the Bible. And he said that he's like, okay, maybe like, which he said, I don't believe that there's anything wrong. He said, it's infallible. He goes, but say that it is. He said, I think there's probably more error in humans. So I'm going to take my chances with what God says over the lots more error that a human says. And I just thought, that's, that's really, really good. The way he put it was more like the way that I would probably put it. He said that somebody told him that there were things that were wrong in the Bible. And he said, well, there's probably more things wrong in you than are what's in the Bible. So I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with the Bible. <laughs> and I'm like, that's, that's probably how I would say yeah. that. And then I'd be like, maybe I could have worded that a little differently. Yeah. <laughs> The last thing I want to read and say um, is James 1, five. It says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach. He tells us to ask him. Ask him. And like Mike was saying this morning, I love how he's talking about how he wants to dwell in us. You know, the Holy Spirit is in us, and so he's right there with us. All we have to do is ask you know, the word says in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. And I think the part that we have to remember is in all our ways, acknowledge him. Because I can say all day long, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. And I do. I love him. I trust him. But in that moment when I'm like, oh, you know, what should we do? Should we fix this car or should we sell it and buy a new one? You know, it's like, well, am I taking that moment and acknowledging him and being like, oh, well, God, you know what we should do because you see the beginning from the end. What do you have to say about this? So, yeah. He gives us wisdom. We can always count on him for wisdom. And wise counsel should confirm his word. Yeah. We do seek wise counsel. It is crucial and important. He puts us in a body for a reason. We need each other. But wise counsel, he uses wise counsel to confirm what he's already saying to us. Yeah, and God encourages us to seek wise counsel. This man wasn't seeking the, the prophet. Mm, the prophet the found him and told him his opinion. Mm. You know, he wasn't seeking that out. Yep. He already knew what God told him to do, and he was doing it. That's he didn't need this guy to come and tell him. But nevertheless, uh, something that I wanted to mention is that this man of God, what was his name? It's never listed. It's anonymous. They don't tell us who he is because we don't need to know. We just know that he was being obedient and we saw what happened. But Jeroboam, it is important for us to understand what happened with Jeroboam. Because even after seeing God, seeing God work, experiencing God work in his own personal life, literally his own, his own arm, like seeing all these things happen, every single thing that that man said came to pass, even his own death. Jeroboam, it says that after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil ways, but again, he, made, you know, he went on and continued to do all this stuff. And because he did, it said that, and this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. Because he knew that this is what God said, and he chose to do something different, his rule, his life and his rule was exterminated from the earth. And so I thought that that was interesting. You know, like, the man was... His name was never even mentioned. It's pretty interesting. Um, Because whenever we are truly doing 
what God wants us to do, it's not for us to get the glory. It's for God to get the glory. He didn't walk up and say, hey, my name is blah, 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 blah. And this is what God told me to tell you because I'm important. That's not what happened. He didn't mention himself because it didn't matter. God's the one that mattered. Yeah. I, I think I'm still hung up on what you said about how he wasn't seeking that prophet out. He wasn't seeking wise counsel, that that man came to him. And I just feel like we, that that's profound because we get that a lot in the world. Everyone always has an opinion. And, and we're all happy to share our opinion with everyone. <laughs> I mean, I'm speaking for myself. We, we're like, hey, this is what I think. It's really, it's really important, <laughs> you know. But, um, and it reminds me of the Garden of Eden. Eve wasn't seeking the serpent out. But he came and had an opinion. And that opinion led her to doubt God's word. So the enemy's tactics don't change. They're the same, you know? So God gives us eyes to see. And my prayer is that, that we will recognize our enemy and recognize when he's coming and he's seeking us out to give us his opinion and that we only hear the voice of God and follow that voice. But Yeah. Um, are, you care, are you okay if I share a little bit of the testimony that you told me the other day? Would you like to share? Okay. So uh, Cheyenne and Tracy, they went down to Texas um, at the beginning of the month. And Cheyenne's getting ready to um, go do some really cool Special Forces stuff. And he was down there doing some training for that. But... Um, Right after that, they decided to go spend some time on the beach, um, but it is kind of hurricane season, and <laughs> Josh and Angie know a lot about that. <laughs> they, uh, they were just trapped down in Mexico for a while. Um, but they went to the beach, and they're just getting, you know, just blasted with sand everywhere. Like, they, there was no way to just enjoy the time, so... They went up and spent some time with uh, her family up in, I think it's the Dallas area, right? And they get blessed with this awesome hotel room and everything and these amazing rates. But then they're coming back in one evening, and uh, he said that they, as they come in, the, the guy behind the counter, he's standing there and he's like looking at him and he's kind of smiling, and then... Cheyenne goes over to chat with him, and and the guy just, like, essentially just felt this great connection with them, like, and the guy started, like, witnessing to you and stuff like that, right, sharing with you about God. And so we are one big family. You know, we are in the family of, of Christ. And, and the guy was saying, there's just something different about you guys. And there is something different about them. It's their relationship with the Lord, you know, and, and they're awesome people outside of that, too, but. Um, but anyhow, this connection just led to this guy just wanting to just just bless them. Just bless them. Just give them whatever. And uh, he's like, anything you want. And Cheyenne's like, well, we we're kind of thinking we'd like to stay another night or two or something. And the guy's like, yeah, absolutely. And he's like, okay, um, can we get the same rate? And the guy's like, yeah, 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 no problem. But then his his generosity even continued, and he's like, you know what? I'm going to give you my own personal family discount. And any time you stay in any hotel that has anything to do with, with this chain of hotels, you're going to get my family discount as long as I work here. Like, just, you know, just, just the overflow of God's grace and his love and his kindness. And I guarantee you they're going to be able to uh, enjoy that gift for a long time, you know? And that's just... It's just an encouragement whenever he was telling me, I'm like, man, that's just like God, you know? Because even sometime down the road, you're going to need that, or God's just going to want to bless you with it, you know? And, and he set that stuff up, and, and it, was, 
it was the Holy Spirit just recognizing the Spirit, you know? Uh, just like, oh, another brother, another family member. And, and uh, um, he was probably from like, what'd you say, maybe Ethiopia or something like that, uh, look and accent and stuff. So um, all across the world, all across the world, you know, God says that, um, that he has people from every, every tribe. He says from, I have people from sheepfolds that you know nothing about. You know, and that's encouraging to me because we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see people. We're like, wow, this is amazing. This is awesome. So um, I hope that this morning encouraged you guys to even get into the word deeper or um, maybe it, it was a revelation to you to go forward with what God's told you to do. If you know that it's him. Maybe it's, it's just what you needed to, to push you on, to do what he told you to do, regardless of if somebody else told you that they didn't think that you should. A lot of people told Paul, don't go to Rome. <laughs> You're going to get your head cut off. And he's like, yeah, I know, but I was told to go anyway. So anyhow, we love you guys, and um, I hope you have an awesome Sunday. Afterwards, we're going to... Um, take some time to pray for people and stuff. And uh, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, if you want to deepen your relationship with God, if you want prayer for anything, come up and see us. Um, feel free to stay after and worship. We're going to do one more worship song and and uh, just have this time of ministry and everything. Did you have something else? I just want to pray over all of us, over you guys and, and over myself to close us out, if that's Perfect. okay. Yep. Lord God, we thank you that you're a good, good father. We thank you, Lord, that you don't hide yourself from us, that you speak and you want us to hear you. So I just pray for each person here this morning that we wouldn't doubt that we can hear our shepherd's voice. And I just pray, Lord God, that we wouldn't be led astray by vain philosophies and doctrines of human reasoning and thinking. I pray that no one would be led astray by false teaching, Lord God, that you would reveal the enemy, you would reveal his lies, you would reveal his plans of attack to us, that we would recognize that, and that we would draw closer to you, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that... As each person here chooses to open up the Bible and to take time with you, Lord God, and maybe they're, maybe they're just starting, Lord, even if, even if we're only investing a couple of minutes, Lord, I just ask you to make your word come alive and speak to each of our hearts and show us your faithfulness and show us your truth and your goodness, Lord. Your word says that we will know your truth and your truth will set us free. So that's my prayer over, over our church and over this body, that we will know your truth, that we will know you, and that we will have freedom because of that truth, Lord. I pray that no weapon formed against anyone here would prosper, that any tongue that would rise up against us would be silenced, and that grace, great would be our peace and undisturbed composure, Lord, because we are rooted and grounded in you because you dwell in us and we choose to abide in you, Lord. We just thank you for this opportunity to just get to talk about you, Lord. I pray that each person would be encouraged and that we would just, as a church body, that we would just encourage each other, be there for each other, build each other, and edify, build each other up and edify each other, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.